house today, isn't it? On this rainy Sunday day, we're glad that you're able to come to be with us and be with us in the house of God. We are missing, we missed church this past week, didn't we? So good to be back today on this Sunday after July the 4th, but I tell you, the fireworks didn't stop with July the 4th, did they? We have had some stormy days, especially over the last few days. Uh, Friday, lightning struck our steeple. Uh, there's a little hole in the side of it. You can see a black part there where it struck it. Thank the Lord it's grounded. didn't uh, uh, attack the church with lightning. But we did have some electronics that got fried. We lost about nine of our cameras. We lost uh, some of our equipment next door. 
and affected some of the cables that we've got to change out as well as uh, blew out one of the telephones. So it was a powerful strike. Lightning is powerful. I thank the Lord. We're able to have church today. PA system still working. We're able to live stream for those that were not able to make it today. And we thank God for that. Thank Him for keeping us. Then yesterday we were without internet all day long and wasn't sure if we'd have it today. And then we had the rain last uh, evening and it flooded the basement and the kitchen of the fellowship hall. And we're getting more rain today. So uh, it's just one of those things. So if we have any volunteers that would like to get water out of the basement, we will make you put you in charge of that project. You can be the chief, the, the, uh, the captain of the boat down there, and you can help get out the water. But uh, there's always something to do around the church, isn't there? I was um, uh, sitting up in the parking lot the other day. I pulled in the other morning, and I saw something coming across the back of the church there, and I thought, first of all, it was a raccoon, but it was a fox. And our neighbor next door has chickens, so I know where he had been. And he came across the back of the church and went up here, and wherever he went, I don't know. But uh, there have been a lot of exciting things happening around here this week. We're looking forward to a great day in the Lord today, this morning, and again tonight. We're back on regular schedule, so make plans to be back tonight at 6.30, Wednesday night, back here at 7, and then on Saturday is going to be that VBS they've been talking about for several weeks now. You'll be hearing more about that later on, but we're glad you're here today. I wonder, do we have any first-time visitors with us in service? Can I see your hand? Anyone here for the very first time? Any returning visitors? We're glad to have you. Good to have all of our church members that are here today and those that are sitting at home watching online. We're glad to have you today watching us. Would you stand? Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask God's anointing and blessing on this service. I don't know about you, but I came to praise the Lord, to bless Him, to worship Him. Let us ask His touch of anointing upon this service. Father, we thank you for this day, your blessings, your benefits. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for answered prayer. Thank you for your protective care and your keeping power. We pray your blessings upon this service. We pray your anointing upon the singers, the songs, the musicians, upon the word. We pray that ears would hear and hearts would receive. Lord, that are those that are watching online today, Lord, that you would touch them and minister in their lives and in their homes. Lord, we thank you for all you've done for us. We're praising you for all you're about to do. For it's in the lovely, wonderful name of Jesus Christ we pray and ask it all. Amen and amen. Would you take a moment now and welcome one another to the Matthews Church of God. We're delighted to have you with us today. Good morning. So good to be in the house of the Lord today. I tell you, we've had a lot of vacation time here, and uh, we're just a little bit behind on our VBS. It's not been such a good week for me today, I mean this past week, but you know what? I'm standing on victory ground today. I'm standing on holy ground today, and I'm expecting God to bless and to touch because he can do it, Sister Nancy. Doesn't matter where you are, what, our prayer is no distance with us or with God. So we're thankful to be in the house of the Lord today. We are getting excited, nervous, anxious about VBS. And yes, it's coming Saturday, as Pastor said, from 9 to 1.30. 
Um, we want you to sign up your kids if you haven't already. Paula will be out there today. She will assist you. And uh, we don't have any VBS food truck t-shirts. If you have a white t-shirt and you'd like a logo of food truck, you can get that from Paula. Uh, kids first and as long as they last. So we have a few out there, so be sure and pick you up one. We want our kids to be first. Oh, yes. Okay, right here is our, we're with the food truck. I'm sorry. <laughs> so this is our Bible storyteller <laughs> for the kids this year. And we're so glad this is Ruth Faircloth. Ruth, you want to say anything to the kids? It's going to be fun. There's lots of good stories in this book. Lots of fun, lots of crafts. I know. Yes. All right. And, do it again. and the thing, you, there's no telling what she, and not only her, but um, where is Shelly? Shelly isn't in here. Vivian, Sharon, where are you? Uh, Vivian, I did see her. Well, they've all left. <laughs> they've left the building. Think, Elvis. No, I there's the right Vivian. There's I need Vivian. to go somewhere else. Okay. The they will be helping her. Give her a round of applause. And again, our dress code, we always have a dress code for our uh, everyone is no shorts and no t uh, tank tops, please. So we have that dress code. Teachers, be sure and see Christina Cooper. Christina, she has the crafts along with Pearlyn. If you don't see her, see Christina if you haven't gotten your craft already because teachers, you got to know how to do that craft, so be sure and see her. And also we have posters for classrooms. Practice today for all praise and worship singers that will be singing in VBS. All uh, Bible characters or skits, this is at 540 today. So now remember, we haven't had time to practice, and we got to practice when we can. So meet us here at 540 in the sanctuary, and we'll try not to go in on the choir time. I'm, I'm thinking they're going to give us some time today as much as we need. So thank you. Thank you much. Let's continue to worship in our tithes and offering. From Psalms 138, I give thanks, O Lord, with all my heart. What better way to express our love for our Father than through our giving? Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the sweet spirit that we feel here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your unseen hand and all your blessings. We just pray, God, that you bless this offering for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> the river to flow in here today. Amen. Come on, can we lift our hands today and just say, God, have your way in this service today. We welcome you. Let the poor man say 
on, forget about everything else. Come on, just worship Him. Somebody ought to lift a praise right now. Come on, worship him.
great I am. We've come to worship him. Hallelujah. Thank God for his presence. We need him. Desperately and urgently we need him. Thank God for this good singing and music today. Praise God. I want to read to you from the gospel according to John chapter 1. Beginning with verse 29 and reading through verse 36. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him. And saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man, which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come, baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit, descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again the next day after John stood, two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. Now I want to use that for my subject topic today. Behold, the Lamb of God. Would you pray God's anointing? Father, we thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, for keeping us and abiding with us. Lord, as we stand before you today, we stand in awe at your glory, your power, your strength, your majesty. We stand in awe that you loved us and gave yourself for us, that you are the Lamb of God, the Son of God. And Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, to yield ourselves unto you, mind, body, soul, and spirit. Arrest our attention. Let our hearts and minds be stayed upon you. Let the Spirit of God touch every heart, especially those that are lost, that they would call upon your name to be saved. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory, all the honor for all you do. For it's in the lovely name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. The word behold is an archaic word that is rarely used today, but when the King James Version was written in 1611, it was a common word. In fact, it was used almost 1,300 times in the Bible. The literal translation of behold is look or pay attention. Both the Hebrew and Greek words mean look or to see, and that's what many of the newer translations use. Whenever you're listening to the news or watching the news, one of the things that you have noticed, especially in the last few years, is that when they ask uh, someone who has been being interviewed a question, they will usually respond with the word look to start with. They'll say look repeatedly throughout their conversation. It seems like everyone these days is pointing to the problem and they're saying look, this is the problem. They'll ask the senators, they'll ask the congressmen, they will ask the politicians, they will ask the the different people on the street. They'll say, look, this is the problem. Look, the economy is the problem with the shortage of food and the the delay of food, the delay of items, the shortages, the problems they're having with that, the high gas prices that, that are higher than we've ever had to deal with before. And they say, look, this is the problem. This is the real problem. And someone else will say, that, look, the war between Russia and Ukraine and all that it is affecting is really the problem. Or someone else will say, look, illegal immigration is really the problem that's affecting our country. And then someone else will say that it's the violence and the unrest that are the problems. And others will say it's the lack of security or protection that is the problem. Some will point out the government and the political corruption that is going on, that is the real 
problem in the land. And others will point out it's the sickness and disease that have has become global that's affecting all the nations of the world. And someone else will say, look, it's the chaos that is the problem in the world. It's not hard to find people who can point out the problems because the problems are many. There's problems everywhere. But I can see John the Baptist wearing his camel's hair garment, fastened with a leather belt, crying out in the wilderness. He didn't say, behold, the problem. He didn't say, behold, the trouble. He didn't say, behold, the crisis. But he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Behold the Lamb of God. Everybody knows the problem, but oh, do they know the answer. Behold the Lamb of God. Enough people are pointing out the problems. Enough people are pointing out the trouble. Enough people are pointing to the crisis. We need more people who will point out Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God. John the Baptist didn't point out the problems, but he pointed out the answer and the solution to the problem. Behold the Lamb of God. Everybody has problems from the richest man on Wall Street to the poorest man in Bangladesh. Everybody has problems. Jesus said, in this world, you will, not might, possibility, but he said, you will have trouble. You're going to have trouble. Maybe you felt like Job 326, I have no peace, no rest, and my troubles never end. It seems like one trouble, one problem after another. But all the physical, all the financial, all the social problems that we face on this earth are temporary. Aren't you glad they're not permanent? Aren't you glad they're temporary? Our light affliction is but for a moment. They will soon be over one way or another. But eternity is forever. And there is no earthly problem that we can face that can compare to that heaven and hell are eternal. Jesus pointed that out in Luke chapter 16. He says that it's better to be a poor, starving man covered with sores for a few years on this earth than to be a rich man spending eternity in hell longing for just one drop of water upon his tongue. Jesus said it would be better to lose an arm and to lose an eye on this earth and go to heaven than to have all your limbs and all your faculties on this earth and end up in hell. In John chapter 5, Jesus told the man who had been healed, who had been an invalid for 38 years, he said, Behold, thou art made a whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Jesus knew the worst thing that could come upon this man was not that he might get sick again. He knew the worst thing that could happen to him was for his sins to send his soul to hell. Nothing else compares to that. Nothing else. Your sin is the greatest problem you have. Your sin is the greatest problem you have. Until you deal with the sin in your life, you don't really have any other problems in comparison. Until you deal with sin, you really don't have any troubles or any other problems that can even compare. Nothing really matters until you know that your sins are forgiven. Until you know your sins are under the blood. You might be up all night long worrying about how you're going to pay your rent or your mortgage or your utilities. But those things are not your greatest problems. They're not the greatest problems you have. It's, it's the sin that is ruining your relationship with God and ruining your relationship with others and sending your soul to hell that is the real problem. 
There's nothing else that's going on in your life that can even compare to that. Your greatest problem is not your husband or your wife. Your greatest problem is not your boss, your co-worker, or your workplace. It's not your weight. It's not your sickness. Your greatest problem is your sin. Things will never be right in your life. Things will never line up in your life until you recognize the greatest problem you have is your sin. And the answer to that sin, the answer to the sin problem is Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's the answer. He's the way. He's the truth, the life. He's the solution. He's the help, the hope that we need. A few years ago, there was a Southwest Airlines flight that was headed from New York to Dallas. 20 minutes into the flight, with no apparent warning, there was a deafening roar as the plane's left engine exploded. It sent shrapnel through the plane, breaking out one of the windows and sucking out one of the passengers partially out of the window and killed her and sent the plane into crash landing. Oxygen mask dropped down and the plane plunged thousands of feet in just a minute's time. It, is, it was a mid-air experience of chaos and terror for these 144 passengers and five crew members. One of the passengers said that when this happened, that she took the hands of her husband and she said, we prayed and we prayed and we prayed the whole time the plane was attempting to land. Nothing was more important in their lives at that moment. They were not worried about whether or not they could lose a few more pounds. They were not worried about whether or not they were going to be able to balance their checkbook. They, there was something much bigger that was happening at that moment that was threatening them. They were about to lose their lives and there was nothing else that was more important than what was happening right then. Our greatest problem is not any of those things that usually occupy our thinking. Our greatest problem is sin that separates us from God. If you are, if you're lost today, the greatest problem you have, the thing that has messed up your life, the thing that has ruined your relationships, the thing that is sending your soul to hell is sin and there's nothing else that can compare to that. There are people who are ugly and uh, they have been mean and vicious and they have hurt you. There's people who have done you wrong but that's not the worst thing that can happen to you. Death it's not the worst thing that can happen to you. It can be over in a moment. But the worst thing that can happen to you is that you might end up in hell for all eternity. A businessman was by here, I guess, a few weeks ago, and we were talking, and uh, he began to tell me how he had been witnessing to this fellow who was lost and said he asked him the question, he said, if you only had six months to live, said, what would you do with your life? What would you work on in your life? What are some things that you would want to do if you knew you only had six months to live? He said, would you, would you write down those things? Then he said, let me go a step further. What if you only had six, after six years, he told him six years to start with. Then he said, if you only had six months to live. He said, if you only had six months, write down the things that would be most important to you and the things that you would want to do. Then he said, let's take it even closer. He said, if you only had six minutes to live, what would you do with your life? What's some things you would want to do? He said, write those things down. It's amazing what things become less important to us and those things that become more important to us the less time we had. A month later, this businessman was somewhere and he said he heard some fellows talking. And he said, this man that he had witnessed to, his name came up. So he walked over to them and he said, uh, who, was, who were you just talking about? And they told him. And he said, what happened to him? He said, haven't you heard? Said his mother passed. And uh, he walked down the aisle 
and went and viewed her in the coffin. He looked at her and turned to the side and he dropped dead. The businessman that, that dropped dead in that, that moment, this businessman said, I wondered, I wondered if what I said to him caused him to call upon the Lord. He sold the seed of God's word and prayed that the spirit of God would convict him and stir him. But you never know, life is that brief. Life can be over in an instant. So we must prepare to meet our God. The greatest desire for every believer is to know God. That's our greatest desire. All of the desires pale in comparison. To know him, to be like him. When the Bible talks about knowing God, it's not just talking about knowing him intellectually or knowing facts about God. To know God, everything else becomes secondary and he becomes first above everything else. He becomes the priority in your life. God must be your passion in your life. He must be your passion in your life. He said, oh, if you want to find him, you've got to Seek him with all your heart. You can't just have a passing, passing casual acquaintance. You just can't just happen by and say a few words. He said, no, if you're hungry and thirsty for righteousness, you shall be filled. If you long for him as the deer pants by the water courses, if if you're hungry and thirsty for him, he said, you can find him, but you've got to want to get in his presence. You've got to want to press in. You've got to want to persevere. You've got to want to seek. You've got to want to knock. You want, you've got to want to desire to get into his presence. Don't let anything get in the way between you and God. There's so many who have just a superficial, such a superficial religion, a passing acquaintance. They know the facts about God. They've heard about God. They can tell you all about the church, but the apostle Paul said, oh, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection in the fellowship of his sufferings that I might be made conformable unto his death. How do I I want to know him. 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 When you trade it all for Jesus, you've gained everything. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. A very wealthy woman was on an ocean liner that struck an iceberg. The ship was doomed. The ship was sinking. It would soon be at the bottom of the sea. She had an option. She could go back to her cabin to gather up her jewels that she had brought with her and possibly lose her life, or she could get immediately into the lifeboat. Wisely, she got into the lifeboat. But from that moment on, all she could talk about was how she gave up all her jewels, to get into the lifeboat. That's all she could talk about. There's a lot of Christians like that. That's all they can talk about. It's as though they've gotten the short end of the stick. Well, I gave up all this just so I could serve the Lord. I quit this and quit that. I quit doing this and going there just to serve the Lord as though that they got the short end of the stick. Let me tell you, you can take the whole world, but give me Jesus. This world doesn't have anything that can compare to Jesus Christ. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. I want to tell you, he's the greatest friend you'll ever have. He's the greatest companion you'll ever know. He's the greatest help that you'll ever need. You can have Jesus Christ and have all that you need to supply every need, to meet every situation, to come into every storm, to come into every trial. He is God, the Son of God. He is the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who will come to your rescue. Nothing in the world compares to what God has to offer. Eliza Edmonds Hewitt, she was an invalid for an extended period of her life. And in that time, in that time of confinement, she just devoted herself to seeking God and getting closer to God and having relationship with him. She had such a a close, intimate relationship with the Lord and she wanted to share that with others. She wanted others to know about it. So she wrote a lot of these thoughts that she had, a lot of the things that she experienced in prayer and and meditation and and fellowship with the Lord. She put them into poems. And many of these poems were, were turned into songs such as there is sunshine in my soul today or will there be any stars 
in my crown and when we all get to heaven and she read Philippians 3 and 10 and she wrote the words to that old hymn more about Jesus would I know more of his grace to others show more of his saving fullness fullness see more of his love who died for me. You see, you know the problem, but do you know Jesus? Do you know the answer to the problem? Oh, that I may know him. I want to know him. I don't want to just go to church and go through the motions and have religion as they call it. I don't want to just go to church and say, well, I go to church and, and I try to cross all the T's and dot all the I's. I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to be like Mary who sat at his feet afraid she might miss even one word that he would speak. I want to be like John who was the first one to get up next to him. No matter where he went, you'd see John. He was always close to Jesus. He made Peter jealous. He got so close to Jesus. I want to be like John the beloved. I want to be like the men who tore the roof off to get their friend to Jesus Christ. If I have to tear off the roof, if I have to press through the crowd like the woman with the issue of blood, if I have to climb up a tree, whatever I need to do, oh, that I may know him, that I might experience him. Hallelujah. I want to tell you this is more than religion. This is more than church membership. This is more than just going to church on Sunday. It's a relationship with divinity. It's a relationship with almighty God, our creator. He created us. He made us. He kept us. And he continues to abide with us. And I may know him. Behold the Lamb of God. It seems that everybody can tell you the problem. And they'll say, something must be done. This must stop. Somebody needs to do something about this. That's all we're hearing. Everyone will tell you how terrible, how difficult things are. But it's not enough just to point out the problems. You get tired of hearing the news because that's all they do. Here's the problem. Look, this is the problem. This is what's happening. Condemnation. Judgment, criticizing, and even ostracizing is not the answer. Even for a crooked, sinful man like Zacchaeus. Anyone can tell you that Zacchaeus was a terrible, terrible man. He worked for the IRS of his day. He was despicable in the eyes of the people. He was probably the most hated man in Jericho. He cheated the people out of their money, he stopped everybody coming into town and he would tax all their possessions. He would tax the wheels on the cart. He would tax the cart and everything in the cart and the animal that pulled the cart. He taxed everything and he would send to Rome what was due to them but then he would pocket everything else. Zacchaeus accumulated his wealth at the expense of others but despite his wealth, despite his position, despite the place of authority that he held, he was a miserable human being. A lot of people think these folks have got it made in Hollywood. I wouldn't want to be in Hollywood. I wouldn't want to live in Hollywood. You think, oh, these people have got it made. There was just a, uh, I didn't watch it all. I saw some, uh, just uh, snippets of it on the news uh, of a couple of, a Hollywood couple that carried out their divorce on television, national television. It just gives you a, just, a, just a little snippet of what's happening in the world. It gives you an idea that all the rich and famous and these people that are so popular, they're not so happy, are they? They don't have it all together, do they? Because I want to tell you, regardless of all the, the promotion and the Hollywood antics and the, the Madison Avenue uh, promotions, as despite all of these things, it does not uh, reveal to you the misery that's in their hearts and their lives. This word of God is true. You can have everything the world has to offer and be miserable. That's why there's so many suicides 
That's why so many people are turning to drugs and alcohol. That's why there's so much misery in the world because they know the problem but they don't know the solution and too long ago the church stopped saying behold the Lamb of God and now they're saying behold our performance and behold our personality, behold our ability, behold our facility. Oh, there's no one who we should lift up like Jesus Christ. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. He's the greatest drawing power that we have. Not our performance, not our programs, not our routines. May I present Jesus to you. Let's get back to preaching Jesus and him crucified. Let's get back to singing Jesus Christ instead of singing some feel-good song. Let's get back to teaching and preaching the name of Jesus Christ because there's power in his name. There's victory in his name. There's salvation in his name. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You can talk about the crooked government. You can point out the government overreach in Zacchaeus' day. You can talk about the crooked politicians who were lining their own pockets. You can talk about the hardship on the poor, on the widows. Those are just some of the many problems that they face. But somebody one day said, behold, look, Jesus. Not the problem. They could have pointed at Zacchaeus all day. You know, for every politician that gets out of the way, there's 10 to take their place. Oh, if so-and-so wasn't in office, if we could just get so-and-so out of the way, there'll be somebody to take their place. The devil has them lined up. Oh, Zacchaeus wasn't the problem. And people could say, this is the problem. This needs to be dealt with. The problem is people are not looking at Jesus. And Zacchaeus heard about the problems. He knew the problems. He knew his own problems. But he heard about Jesus. He heard Jesus is a friend of sinners. What about that? Not the religious elite, not the high and mighty. He's a friend of sinners, a friend of a sinful man like me. One day somebody said, look, it's Jesus. Look, Jesus is coming down the road. Behold, the Lamb of God, Jesus is coming. Zacchaeus wanted to see him. And all oh, people would just want to see him. Want to see him. Get your head off your chest. Get your, get, your, get your chin off your chest. Get your eyes lifted up. He said, look to Jesus. Look unto him, the author and the finisher of your faith. Look unto him. Look to Jesus Christ. Somebody said, look to him. And Zacchaeus was a, was a short man. He was, he was a vertically challenged. So he climbed up into a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And all oh, Jesus came passing by that way and stopped under the tree and said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for I'm going to your home today. I'm going to your house today. He's been going home with people ever since. He'll go home with you today. Make haste for I must abide at thy house. No one had ever talked to Zacchaeus like this man. All he had heard was cursing, complaints, sarcasm, criticizing people putting him down. But here's a man who says, I want to go home with you. I want to get to know more about you. Make haste. Hurry up. Come down. And the Bible says he received Jesus joyfully. Oh, aren't you glad you received Jesus joyfully? You don't have to drag somebody who really wants to know Jesus to the house of God. You don't have to drag them to the altar. Joyfully receive the Lord because he's everything that you have need of. Zacchaeus knew his sins. He didn't need Jesus to point out his sins. He already knew them. He didn't, Jesus didn't come that way to tell Zacchaeus what a crooked man he was, what a wicked man he was, what a terrible man he was, what a sinful man that he was. He didn't come that way to tell him that, that he was wretched for robbing and stealing and, and stuffing his own pockets. He didn't come that way to con condemn Zacchaeus. You see, a lot of people think that's all the Lord's gonna do. He's gonna condemn me. If I go to church, he's gonna condemn me. Let me give you a scripture, John three seventeen. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might 
be saved. That's his will, that all men everywhere become saved. He wants everybody to make it to heaven. It's not his will that any be lost or be perished, but all come to repentance. The Lord wasn't so much concerned about his occupation. He wasn't so much concerned about his reputation, but he was concerned about his soul. Zacchaeus needed to look to Jesus. We can get our eyes on so many things and not be looking at Jesus. The devil is an author of distraction. He's doing all he can to distract us to keep our eyes off of Jesus. Because looking at the problem, looking at the blame, looking at someone to blame never changes anything. There's always people pointing their fingers saying, well, it's their fault. Well, that's not gonna fix it. They're the culprit. That's not gonna change things. Pointing out the problem, pointing out the, those that are involved in the problem, they're not, that's not gonna solve anything. They need to point to the answer. And Zacchaeus met Jesus. He looked to Jesus and became a changed man from that day forward. He announced to Jesus this. He said, I'm giving half of my possessions to the poor. Jesus didn't tell him to do that. Jesus didn't say, Zacchaeus, if you want to be saved, if you want to get right, then you've got to give half your possessions to the poor. No, he did that of his own volition. Because when you get changed, it has an effect on how you live and how you do. He said, I'm going to pay back four times to those that I have defrauded. There was something about Jesus that changed Zacchaeus and how he saw the world. You see, the world is in darkness. The world is blind. That's why they live like they live. That's why they talk like they talk. They're in darkness. They're in the darkness of sin, the bondage of sin. They're blind and cannot see. They cannot understand what you and I are talking about today. That's what sin does. It, it affects all your faculties. It affects you and your understanding. But Jesus Christ will clear things up. The brightness of his glory, the power of his spirit. He'll open your eyes that you can see and your ears that you can hear and your heart that you can understand and receive. Suddenly and instantly, one encounter with Jesus Christ changed Zacchaeus into another man. Just one look, that's all it took. One look was all that it took. No wonder John the Baptist thundered over the Judean Valley and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. People started looking at John, got their eyes on John. He said, No, sir, you need to get your eyes back on Jesus Christ because it's not about me. You might think I'm somebody, but he said, There's somebody coming after me mightier than I whose shoes I'm not worthy to bow down and unlatch it. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost stand with fire. They said, oh, but John, oh, John said, no, it's not about me. I've got to decrease so he can increase. I want you to see him and know him because he's the savior of the world. He's the healer, the deliverer. He's the, he's the daysman. He's the mediator. He's the fourth man in the fire, the wheel of the wheel, the stream in the desert, the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. He's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. I want to tell you about Jesus Christ because he has come to save. He has come to redeem. He's come to deliver. He's come to sanctify. He's come to fill with the Holy Ghost. He's come to bring deliverance to the captives or the covering of the sight to the blind to set in liberty that, that approves and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Let me tell you about Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. As a young man, Charles Spurgeon was burdened with his sin. He went from church to church to church, listening to all the great preachers of his day about how he could be forgiven and go to heaven. He said he heard one preacher preach Calvinism, another preacher preach Methodism, another preach this, another preach that. Finally, one winter's day, the church he planned to attend was closed because of a snowstorm. So he ducked inside this little primitive Methodist chapel where he said a shoemaker was up preaching because the minister had been snowed out. Spurgeon said the man, he said the man was really stupid. That's his word. The man was really stupid. He couldn't even pronounce all the words right. His text was Isaiah 45 and 22. Look to me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. That was his text. 
This is what the shoemaker said that day. He said, this is a very simple text indeed. It says, look. Now looking don't take a deal of pain. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It is just look. Well, a man needn't go to college to learn to look. You may be the biggest fool and yet you can look. A man needn't be worth a thousand a year to look. Anyone can look. Even a child can look. Jesus Christ says, look unto me. Look unto me. I'm sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me. I am hanging on the cross. Look unto me. I'm dead and buried. Look unto me. I rise again. Spurgeon said this man preached about 10 minutes. That's all he had. But he said this pathetic preacher, when he finished preaching, looked right at him. And he said, young man, you look very miserable. Young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing to do but to look and to live. Spurgeon said all at once he understood. All at once he understood. He had been waiting to do 50 things. But now he saw it wasn't what he could do but just look, look to Jesus. He suddenly had the cloud to go away. The darkness rolled away because he began to look upon Jesus Christ. How did that happen? Spurgeon said, he said, look unto Jesus. That's about as simple as it can be. Look unto Jesus. Get your eyes off of Washington. Get your eyes off the White House. Get your eyes off of Congress. Get your eyes off your neighbor. Get your eyes off your trouble. Get your eyes off your problem. And look Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. It's amazing how things will clear up. It's amazing how much better things will be. If you just look to Jesus, get your eyes off the preacher. Get your eyes off of the church. Get your eyes off of society. Get your eyes on Jesus Christ. When you look at him, you'll have to say as Pilate, I find no fault in him. There's no sin in him. There's no guile in his mouth. He's the perfect sinless son of God. If you want to know the answer to the greatest problem, if you want to know what the greatest answer to the greatest problem is, if you want to know that your sins are forgiven and that they're underneath the blood of Christ, look to Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God, John said. He's the answer. He's the solution. Look to him. Look to Jesus. You don't have to do 50 things to be saved. Just look to Jesus and be saved. Whosoever shall call of the name of the Lord shall be saved. How simple is that? How simple is that? Anybody can be saved. It's God's will that all be saved. I want our musicians to come if they will. Souls in danger, look above. Jesus completely saves. Jesus is the answer. He's the answer to your greatest problem. The greatest problem of all people everywhere, from Wall Street to Bangladesh, is sin. Everyone, everywhere, needs to look to Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. Would you stand with me, please? All the problems we have are temporary, but eternity is forever and forever. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. While the heads are bowed, the eyes are closed, the saints are praying. Father, we thank you for reminding us once again that Jesus is the answer. There's no one beside him. There's no one like him. We see so many problems. We see so many troubles in this world. So many things are unraveling and coming apart of the scene. But, oh, Lord, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, and you change not. You're the rock of ages that withstand the storms of time, all the protest, all the contest, all the wickedness that's going on in this world has not changed you. You're still a loving Lord that wants and longs to save the lost, to rescue the perishing. Lord, I pray today for those that are lost that they would call upon your name. Those that are here and those that are watching online or some that may be watching later on. Lord, that they'll do, that they'll realize that Our life can be reduced to six years, to six months, to six minutes. Our life can be reduced to a moment to when all we have left is you. But if we have you, we have everything we need. Lord, we pray your touch this day in Jesus' name. 
Hallelujah. Let me ask first of all while the saints are praying. Is there someone here today who wants to be saved? Would you come? Give your heart to Jesus. You've tried religion. You've gone through all the re religious process. But there's an emptiness in your life. There's something missing in your life. I want you to look to Jesus. I want you to look to him today. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Come to Jesus and find cleansing, deliverance. Come to him. He'll break the yoke that binds. He'll break the chains that bind you. He'll break those fetters asunder. He'll set you free if you'll come to him. Would you come today? Come today. Call on his name. Call on his name. Maybe there's some here who have gotten off course. You've gotten distracted. But you want to rededicate and recommit your life. Get your eyes back on Christ. Get them off your problems and get them on the Lord. Would you come? Make your way to this altar. Maybe you've got a family member that's lost. Would you come? We're running out of time. Just like this businessman who talked to his friend. He didn't know that just in a little while this man would die not knowing whether or not he made it. We've got family members that are lost. Would you come and pray a prayer for them? Somebody you know that needs the Lord, would you pray right now that they would call upon the Lord to be saved?